All right, last part of chapter 12. So in this uh, video, what we're going to be concentrating on is the third point, which is using Ampere's law. Just to remind you, in the last video that I hope you watched, we learned why um, two wires that carry current in the same direction attract each other and why they will repel each other if the currents run in opposite directions. In general, we found the expression for the force between the two wires could be expressed in, that, in this way. We actually express it in force per unit length because usually we're assuming that our wires are very, very long. So it just makes more sense because in the case that we consider them infinitely long, that would really cause a lot of trouble. We also looked at the uh, magnetic field due to a loop of wire um, somewhere along the central axis of the circle. Um, and you could be this the distance y along the y-axis that passes through the center of the circle. And then we could also find that for the magnetic field at the very center. If we wanted to find, in general, the direction of the magnetic field due to that wire loop, we can use the right-hand rule, where our thumb is going to give us the direction of the magnetic field. All right, so let's get going with the new material, Ampere's Law. Um, Ampere's Law has to do with an integral, which is the magnetic field dotted with a displacement. And so in this picture, we chose to have a long wire of current that's coming out of the page. And we know that that wire makes a magnetic field that forms circles around it. So we're going to integrate around that circle. We're going to put this symbol on our integral to indicate that we're going around a closed path. That just means we're going to go the whole way around the circle. And the reason that that circle makes sense is because everywhere on the circle we can draw the magnetic field as a tangent. It's tangent to the circle at that point. That's its direction. And so as we go around the circle, our magnetic field and our uh, DL are going to be parallel to each other. That simplifies this integral a little bit because then we can get rid of the dot product and it's just time B times DL. And then because the magnetic field is constant on that circle, we can take the magnetic field symbol out. And if we integrate all the way around the circle, we're going to get a total distance of the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. Now, one of the things I forgot was that the magnetic field at that location is, can be written as mu naught i over 2 pi r. And then we're multiplying this by 2 pi r. And so the end result is that this integral is equal to mu naught i. So just to summarize, we found that when we integrate the magnetic field around that closed loop, that integral is equal to mu naught times i. And this i was inside the path, and that becomes important. This is really a statement of Ampere's law. Now, we did derive it for a very particular case, but we're going to sort of expand it and say, well, in general, this is always going to be true. For example, if we had many wires traveling through the circular path, the yellow path here being um, the path that we're integrating around, it actually we're going to find is that that integral is going to be equal to mu naught times the sum of the currents. So when we said B equals mu naught dot DL, and that's going to be the yellow path in this picture, is the path we're going to take is going to be equal to mu naught times I, and that's going to be the total current inside. Oops. So to put it in a little of a neater form, in this picture on the right hand side we see some wires that are going um, through that are enclosed by my path. 
but some of them are up and some of them are down. And so it makes sense that if I add them together, some of them must be positive and some of them must be negative. Uh, the way that we can find out is, again, a right-hand rule. So we're going to, if we wrap our fingers in the direction that we integrate around the loop, our thumb will point in the direction of the positive current. And so that actually tells us that I1 and I3 are positive. And so if we wanted to find the total current enclosed, it would be I1 minus I2 plus I3. And so if we did the integral of B dot DL, it would be equal to mu naught, and then we could write as I1 minus I2 plus I3. And so this becomes our general statement of Ampere's law, where the I here is the total current enclosed. And what we are going to do is we are going to show you some examples where Ampere's law is a much easier way to calculate the magnetic field due to a particular arrangement of current or a type of current distribution. Our first example is we're going to have, instead of a long, thin wire, we're going to have a cylinder of current where the total current is spread out um, throughout the cross-sectional area. So really, like, like there's kind of current all through here, and this is the total area. And so in all, we have a current equal to I naught, but instead of like one thin line, it's in a cylinder. So we're going to use Ampere's law to find the magnetic field. The first time, we're going to <coughs> excuse me, have a, find it at a radius that's larger than the actual radius of the cylinder. So if we imagined our circle that goes around, it's going to be our path and this is going to be an R, and that's actually going to be larger than the A. And again, remember that the magnetic field is going to go around in this direction. So we're going to do B dot A, DL, sorry, is equal to mu naught I. I like to write I enclosed just to remind me that it's however much current I have inside. Now I've chosen my circle and I know that as I go around that circle my magnetic field is always going to be parallel to DL. So I can rewrite this as just BDL. And then the B is constant on the on the circle that I chose the magnetic field would have a constant magnitude. And if I go the way, whole way around the circle, I'll have a distance of 2 pi r. And the current that I've enclosed is I naught. So I end up finding that the magnetic field, due to the cylinder of wire, when I'm outside of the wire, is mu naught I naught over 2 pi r. Notice, it looks just like a long, thin wire. You might think, that reminds me of how I, if I have a sphere of charge, it actually, the electric field due to the sphere of charge looked just like it was a point charge at the center. Hmm, yes, it's very similar. Next, we're going to look at what if we look inside the cylinder. So here we have our radius shown over here in picture B of looking at the this, we're looking at the end of the cylinder, but that's where we want to find the magnetic field. Magnetic field's still going around in this counterclockwise direction, but I'm going to, again, use Ampere's law. And so um, the way that I've chosen my path, the magnetic field, and DL are parallel to each other, so I can just write that as BDL. And B can be constant, so it can go outside the integral. And if I go the whole way around the circle, I'm going to get 2 pi r. 
Now, I have to find how much current I've enclosed. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, in general, the current per area, where this is the area, this circle, is a constant. So if I take the entire circle, the entire cross-sectional area of the cylinder, which has an area of pi a squared, I'll get the total current, which is I naught. If I take a smaller circle, which has an area of pi r squared, I get the I enclosed. And so if I rearrange this, I get pi r squared over pi a squared I naught, which is just equal to r squared over a squared I naught which basically says I'm going to take a fraction of the current because r squared over a squared is going to be some fraction. So let's take this over here. I get b times 2 pi r equals mu naught i enclosed, which we found was equal to mu naught r squared over a squared i naught. And now I can solve for b. And if I simplify this a little, I'll get mu naught i r over 2 pi a squared. So here, the magnetic field increases with the radius. So, and that makes sense. As I get further away from the center of the cylinder, the magnetic field is going to get stronger and stronger. If we put it all together in a picture, this is what the magnetic field looks like of that long wire, well, the one that was a cylinder. Here's the radius of the cylinder is A. So in this part, it increased as R, and it reached this value at the surface, and then it dropped off as 1 over R. And so that's what that current, that magnetic field due to that cylinder of current look like. Another like nifty thing that we do with magnetic fields is when we find when we make a solenoid. So basically a solenoid is like a spring made up of a current carrying wire, except it's not loose, it's very tight like you see over here. And the whole purpose of this uh, coil of wire, and this is a cutaway view here, and what they're trying to show here is if you cut it in half, on the right-hand side, the current's going into the page, and on the right left-hand side, the current's coming out of the page. And if we do our little right-hand rule for the magnetic fields that all these little pieces are creating, what happens is in the middle, all the fields are adding together to, for the most part, create a magnetic field down the center of the solenoid that is relatively constant, and that's really why we would use a solenoid in the first place, is to make a relatively uniform magnetic field in the center of it. But we want to use the Ampere's law to figure out an expression for the magnetic field due to that solenoid. So let's take a look. Now we're going to use a little bit of a different path. This is our path here, and it's a rectangle. So when I'm using Ampere's law, which says I'm going around a closed path, it makes more sense to write it as a sum of four pieces, representing the four different legs of that rectangle. So when we do the first part, and all this is equal to mu naught i enclosed. All right, so when we do the first part of it, that's this part. And notice there the magnetic field and the 
L would be parallel to each other. So for 1, I'd just get B times DL. Now in part 2, the B dot, dot DL, these two things are perpendicular to each other. And so this piece, number 2, is actually zero. It doesn't make any contribution. And in part three, when I do B dot DL, I'm outside of the solenoid. So B is equal to zero. So once again, that leg of my integration doesn't contribute anything. And finally, I add B dot DL for leg four. And again, these two are perpendicular to each other, which means that the dot product is zero. So for all four pieces of that rectangle, the only part that made a contribution was part one. And all that is equal to mu naught I enclosed. So when we look at B times DL, well, the length of leg number one is just L, so it just ends up to be B times L is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. Now, the amount of current enclosed is going to be the current in each of the windings, like one of these, and then multiply it by however many turns, that's what we call them, turns we have that were enclosed by my box, and we'll just say that that's N. So if I rearrange this, I write I have mu naught big N over L times I. So N can be the total number of turns, and L is the length of the solen solenoid. Or sometimes we write it as mu naught little N times I, where little N is just N over L. So it's just, which is just the number of turns per unit length. So we end up with this expression is more common. This is what we use for the magnetic field of a solenoid. And here you see that sort of a more realistic picture for the solenoid. Of course, the magnetic field isn't exactly the same the whole way through, but in the very middle, it's pretty much constant and equal to the maximum value, which is equal to this. And that is it for chapter 12.